In this video, I'm gonna beat Pokemon Yellow with only a Shelter. This is a highly requested video, and I'm glad I'm finally getting around to it. Over the years, I've had many plans to play Shelter in the past, and I've just always canceled this video, so at long last, here it is. I know at least one of you has been really waiting for this video, and I apologize for all the delays. Now, speaking of delays, Shelter um, has a slow growth rate. I have no idea why that was the thing that Game Freak decided to do. Like, Cloyster does have the highest base defense in the game, and that's probably why they gave it the worst growth rate, but this is just really frustrating when I have to solo the game with a first stage Pokemon. Plus, Shelter's stats are honestly not very good. 30 HP, 65 attack, 100 defense, 40 speed, and 45 special. As a water type in generation 1, the low special stat is really unfortunate. Also, the low speed is a problem in yellow version, because the mid game has some major enemy level boosts, and it also gives me a low critical hit rate of only 7.8%. Typically though, water types have decent move pools, but Shelter is not one of them. It starts with Tackle and Withdraw, and while one of these moves is a water type move, it doesn't do any damage, so I'm gonna have to grind until a quite high level to defeat Brock. The next move I learn is at level 18, which is supersonic, and it has 55% accuracy. Finally, at level 23, it learns a water type move in the form of Clamp. From there, things get much better. Aurora Beam at level 30, and Ice Beam at level 50. Through TM and HM, Shelter gets the standard water type coverage, which is both the water type moves, both the ice type moves, and Surf through HM. It unfortunately doesn't get access to standards like Body Slam. That would have been really nice considering its attack is much higher than its special, but if I want a normal move, I'm gonna have to rely on something like Takedown, Double Edge, or Tri Attack. Because yeah, we get Tri Attack. We also get Swift, which could have a niche use at least later on. Thinking about this move pool holistically, I just wish Shelter learned a water type move at level 18 to give me some other option for Brock. Now, Shelter's options for learning are limited, but yours aren't, and that brings me to the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. It's a platform where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. All things that are probably of interest to you if you're watching my video. The lessons are designed as hands-on experiences that help you build knowledge from the ground up, avoiding massive walls of text or long, boring lectures. This is one of the reasons I like the platform so much. Also, the lessons target developing critical thinking skills rather than just forcing you to memorize facts. And Brilliant is very helpful in getting you to establish a daily learning habit. There's always so much to do every day, and sometimes self-improvement seems like it gets left by the wayside. But in this case, with just 5-10 to 10 minutes of fun, interactive lessons every day, you can get new information into your brain. Plus, it's a great thing to do when you have a few minutes free and you want to avoid endless, mindless scrolling. Right now I'm working my way through the Programming with Python course because I want to improve my skills building small automated tools behind the scenes to improve my workflow. I'm always amazed by computers and just how much of my work can be automated away so that I don't have to do the boring repetitive tasks. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for a free full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash scottsthoughts or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring the video and now let's get back to the Shelter playthrough and we're going to jump slightly ahead in the footage into Viridian Forest. It's now time to start considering what options I have against Brock. The only offense move I'll have access to is Tackle, and it's not very good. It's a normal type move which is resisted by his rock types, its base power is only 35, and its accuracy is 95%. With 35 PP, we should be expecting somewhere around two of my hits to miss as I deplete all of the power points. Brock's Geodude has 29 HP, and Brock's Onyx has 32 HP. So if I have any hope of beating them, I'm going to need to be doing more than one damage per hit. Now I have a confession to make, this isn't actually my first Shelter playthrough. I did one a really long time ago when I was trying out a new process behind the scenes. It didn't end up working out for me, and then this footage got boxed for far too long. I upgraded my overlay, and by the time I would have got around to making it into a video, the footage just looked too bad, so I decided not to use it. So we're technically watching my second Shelter playthrough right now, and that means I have a little bit of extra information. When I planned for the first run, I learned that I needed to be level 17 to get 2 damage per hit against the Geodude and the Onyx. Doing the training required required for this takes forever because of the slow growth rate. After defeating most of the trainers in the early game, including the camper in Brock's gym, my shelter is only level 11. I head back to the forest and start my grind on wild Pokemon, quickly leveling up to 12, but now things are gonna slow down. 
I'll mention here that I have intentionally skipped the rival on Route 22, because if I beat him there, then he's going to choose Jolteon as a part of his final team, and I don't want that to be the case when Shelter has a low speed stat. I do in this case think that I'm going to have an easier time against Magneton, especially because Shelter's attack is higher than its special. You'll see why that's relevant later on into this run. My Shelter reaches level 15 after 16 minutes of playtime. Remember, I do all these challenges on 4 times game speed, so this is a long time. It would have been more than an hour if I was doing this on 1 times game speed. And the levels are really slowing down from here because it takes me almost 3 more minutes to get to level 16. With the clock now ticking over 19 minutes, I was getting pretty impatient, and I decided to give Brock a try at this level. Geodude is up first. I figured that setting up with Withdraw here made a lot of sense, that way the Geodude is doing only 1 damage per hit with Tackle, and I didn't want to move on to the Onyx without fully maxing out my defense stat, because when he uses Screech it lowers my defense by 2 stages, meaning moves like Bind can do a lot of damage because it's a multi-hit move. Okay, so the Geodude is going to take a little bit of time to knock out because I have to rely on Tackle, but it does look like it's doing more than 1 damage, which is good for my PP. Now I'll take some time to just draw your attention to my Shelter speed stat, it's 25, meaning that I'm going to move first against the Onyx, so it's never going to be able to deal damage when it uses the move Bide. That'll also give me time to re-establish Withdraw if my defense has been lowered by Screech. I finish off the Geodude, move on to the Onyx. Looks like I might be doing more than one damage every turn. Every time it uses Bide, I can just use Withdraw to buy time. It's really nice that Withdraw doesn't have like 10 or 15 PP. With 35 PP, it's never going to run out, and I'm always going to be able to stall Bide out. There is a downside there, though, which which is I'm probably not going to be able to use Struggle, so if I don't have enough damage using Tackle, the Onyx will defeat me. As the battle progresses, you're going to realize that I am doing more than one damage per hit, and I'm going to have enough uses of Tackle, provided the Onyx doesn't crit too many times when it uses Bind. Luckily, this is still only doing two damage per hit, because Shelter's base defense is decent. So why am I dealing two damage per hit at level 16, where my former calculations told me that I needed level 17? Well, when I played Shelter, I didn't have access to RBYX, XP router, so I ran the calculations in a software called Route 1, and in order to be level 17 to face Brock, I just gave myself rare candies to test the damage ranges. So the reason I'm doing more damage at level 16 now is because I accumulated more stat experience in my attack stat. So this is one instance where stat experience really matters, and as a result I'm able to defeat Brock on my first attempt at level 16. Granted, it is a split of 20 minutes and 24 seconds, which is quite frankly terrible. Let's put this result in the context of all of the other first stage water types in Generation 1. Poliwag starts with Bubble, so it's able to crush Brock. Tentacool doesn't get access to a water type move, having only Acid, but it gets Supersonic at level 7 and then Rap at level 13. Both of those moves are actually quite useful against Brock. Slowpoke starts with Confusion. Seal only gets Headbutt, but this move is so much better when compared with Tackle. It has twice the base power and a 30% chance to flinch. Krabby starts with Bubble, and while its special attack is terrible, Brock is just awful against water type moves, so it doesn't matter. Horsey also starts with Bubble. Goldeen gets access to Tail Whip, which can lower the opponent's defense, giving Peck more damage. Lapras is technically a first stage water type. Well, it's kind of a mono stage. I don't know if you consider it in the same category, but it gets Water Gun, so of course it doesn't have problems. Almanite also gets access to Water Gun, and now we have exhausted all the water types that don't struggle against Brock. Well, Seal technically struggles against Brock, but Headbutt is pretty good, so I'm not putting it in the same category. Psyduck only has access to Scratch. Staryu gets only Tackle, so it's in a very similar situation when compared with Shelter. And finally, Kabuto gets both Scratch and Harden, but its normal type move is far superior to Scratch. So Shelter is either the worst or the second worst water type Pokemon in the Brock split. Staryu is the only Pokemon that might be slower than it, but at least at level 17 it learns Water Gun. For Shelter, it has to wait all the way until it gets to Mount Moon, where I can grab the TM and then teach it its first water type move. I'm not feeling particularly confident in the next section of the game with Shelter, so I'm going to do some additional training here because some of the trainers give fast experience, like specifically this hiker. By the time I'm completing the cave, grabbing the dome fossil, and then finishing off Jesse and James, my Shelter has grown all the way to level 20. I now have to make a strategical choice. Do I fight the rival on Nugget Bridge or Misty first? The former choice gives no advantage to Shelter, but the latter means that I could get the TM for Bubble Beam before doing all of Nugget Bridge. And generally with water types, this will really speed up your progress over the next section of the game, so I decided to go for Misty's gym.
in here, you're gonna notice that I have taught my shoulder bide. Typically this move is kind of useless, but I thought against Misty that it could actually serve a purpose. Against her star you, I set up one turn of withdraw, and then I knock it out with tackle. Now for the star me, because of Misty's AI, she's only gonna be using moves tackle and harden. If she sets up her defense, then I wanna wait to deal consistent damage. And I figured since she's gonna be using tackle about 50% of the time, if I go for bide, I can bypass her defense boosts and deal massive damage. But uh, yeah, bite is really bad and I have to take damage in the process of using it. Plus, Shelter is slower than both of her Pokemon, so she's able to attack first before I use each instance of Bide. As a result, she defeats me, giving Shelter its first reset. I tried the battle again. This time I get brought down to orange health by the Starmie, and I realized that using Bide is just not going to work from here. So I'm going to have to use Tackle to finish it off, and unfortunately it tackles too many times, taking me out first. So theoretically, Bide might be better, but I think there's another way to play this battle. Since the Staryu is very weak, and it only has Tackle it can never set up with Harden, I can just spam withdraws, going all the way to plus 6 defense. This way, her Starmie is going to do much less damage every time it attacks me using Tackle. Then instead of using Bide, I'm going to use Tackle until it sets up its defense a decent amount. After that, I can use Water Gun if I don't think I'm going to get critical hits, and I want a little bit more damage per turn. By doing things this way, I'm able to take out her Starmie, and earn myself the second badge and the TM for Bubble Beam, which of course I teach right away in the place of Bide. Okay, so let's leave the gym. We're going to walk past the Pokemon Center, go through this house, pick up the rare candy that's in Cerulean City. This is the second one in the playthrough. Then I save the game and I battle the rival. I intentionally showed you all of that footage because I did not heal, so I have less than half health at the beginning of the battle against the rival. Luckily for me, Bubble Beam is able to one-hit both the Spearow and the Santru, and those are his two most difficult Pokemon. From there, the Rattata also goes down to a single Bubble Beam, and then things slow down against the Eevee because it has decent special. That said, it's has terrible attacks against Shelter, so I'm able to take it out and defeat the rival. I'm really glad I didn't have a reset there because of my mistake. Okay, Nugget Bridge, it's the time to reflect on how the run has been going so far, and the answer is uh, quite dismally. We are approaching 30 minutes on the clock, and we haven't even got to the third gym leader yet. For context, some Pokemon like Victory Bell will be around Giovanni by this time. At the end of Nugget Bridge, I have a close run-in with this guy who has a Mankey. Now, you might think this is because Low Kick is doing a lot of damage due to the fact that it's a fighting-type move, but remember, Shelter is not an Ice-type. It only gains this typing when it evolves into Cloister. Winning this battle gives me enough experience to level up to 23, and I'm going to teach Clamp in the place of Water Gun. I want to keep Withdraw so I can utilize the badge boost glitch later on, and having Clamp, which is a trapping move, is going to give me answers to some Grass-type Pokemon coming up in the near future, like this lass at the end of Nugget Bridge. Her Oddish gave Almanite so many problems, but since I can just clamp them down and then use Bubble Beam, they aren't a problem for Shelter. This is because in Generation 1, the trapping mechanic works in a way where the opponent cannot attack as long as the trapping move continues. So I would have to miss a clamp in order for them to attack me, which doesn't happen in this battle. Before Vermilion City, Sandy isn't an issue because Bubble Beam can one-shot all of her Pidgeys. On the SSN, I grab the TM for Rest. This is probably going to be required in the late game, and then I skip the TM for Body Slam because sadly, like I said before, it's just not available to me. I defeat the Gentleman, grab the Rare Candy, and then I go up against the Rival again. Shelter doesn't do quite as well in this fight, but once again, like the previous battle, the Rival's team just isn't very good against Pokemon that have high defense stats this early on. So I finish him off and with that, Surge is coming up next. Typically I make fun of him because he is one of the worst gym leaders in the game, but I'm not going to do that today because I'm using a shelter and things have not been going well so far. Okay, roll the intro, let's take on Surge. First turn, what does he do? He uh, he goes for X speed, raising his already fast Raichu's speed to 97. Don't worry, it was going to move first against Shelter anyway. I use Clamp. It isn't doing that much damage, but it hits a total of three times, so that's one third on the Raichu. It uses Mega Punch on the next turn. Remember, Surge does not have good AI. My next Clamp hits three more times, taking it down to orange health. He uses another Mega Punch, and uh, as a result, I defeat Surge on my first attempt. Okay, I was overthinking things. I definitely should have made fun of him. 
him. The next mandatory trainer in the route is the Wrapping Lass, and she is a serious threat for most water types, especially ones that don't have normal moves. Now, Shelter does have Tackle, but I don't think it's going to one-hit the Oddish, meaning I could get hit by Stun Spore and then trapped in endless wraps by the Bellsprout. My strategy here was to rely on Clamp so that I can trap the Oddish, preventing it from using Stun Spore, and then eventually finish it off with either Bubble Beam or Tackle. The issue is that while Clamp is a solution, if it misses, then the Oddish can use one of its status moves on me. In this case it uses Poison Powder, which is typically the better situation for the player, but when I'm relying on Clamp, that means poison damage is going to stack up on each one of my hits. Also, then if the Bellsprout gets a successful wrap off, I take even more poison damage every turn. Yeah, this doesn't end up working out, and Shelter faints. In the next fight, I make it past the Oddish without getting a status condition and move on to the Bellsprout. Now, it goes for Sleep Powder against me, which I guess is okay. Eventually, I wake up, and then it poisons me. Alright, that's really annoying. I can't get Stun Sport now, so I can use Tackle against the Oddish, but this takes a total of three turns to knock it out, and I needed a lucky critical hit to make it happen. All that's left is her final bell sprout. I go for tackle, it does less than half, and poison takes me down to 11 HP. Bellsprout luckily goes for growth, so it doesn't attack me with a wrap. That's convenient. My next tackle takes it down to a sliver of health. Poison takes Shelter to 7 hit points. And yeah, the Bellsprout goes for another growth, allowing me to finish it off. This was a really lucky win, and because of Shelter's move pool, I don't really see a better way to do it other than training to level 30, which is just going to be far too inefficient. Before clearing Rock Tunnel, there are still some grass types that I have to contend with using my current move set. The status condition junior trainer has an Oddish and a Bulbasaur. She's typically less of an issue when compared with the Raving Lass, but today the Oddish paralyzes me, I run out of Clamp PP, and then the Oddish finishes me off. What I'm relying on here is good Clamp Luck, I get it in the next battle and take her out. The self-destructing hiker isn't an issue because I have water type moves, but there's one more junior trainer in the cave and she does have an Oddish. In this case I miss my clamp and it goes for sleep powder, then uses a ton of absorbs and uh, yeah, Shelter faints again. I have had really bad luck against these grass types. At least that's the way it feels and this feeling just persists because the Oddish once again puts me to sleep and takes me out. On my third attempt against the junior trainer she poisons Shelter, which I guess is better than sleep and this does allow me to take the victory. With the tunnel clear to head south of Lavender Town and pick up the TM for Swift. This is a better normal type move when compared with Tackle, so I'm going to teach it to Shelter right away in that move's place. We've reached the mid game, and now it is time to do some additional training, which I'm going to start before I make it to Celadon City. Of course with the slow growth rate, I'm going to take my time, explore the Rocket Hideout, grabbing a bunch of high priced items so that I can buy more vitamins, and I'm also going to collect an additional rare candy. In the department store after buying my super repels, I head to the top floor and pick up the TM for Ice Beam. Because Shelter is fairly slow, buying Carbos seems like the best and most safe choice in the mid game. I feed it 4 in total, and then teach it Ice Beam in the place of Bubble Beam. I want to keep Clamp around just so I can trap key foes. This move is still going to have some utility and I'm not actually sure if I'm going to end up deleting it throughout the rest of the playthrough. We'll have to see how things go. Okay, time for the rival battle in Pokemon Tower. When I knock out the Fero, I level up to 30 and here Shelter can learn Aurora Beam. Sadly, this move comes too late because I've already learned Ice Beam, which is really unfortunate. If this thing learned Aurora Beam around level 24, all of the grass type Pokemon that I just struggled against wouldn't be an issue. The Magnemite that's next doesn't know any electric type moves so it isn't a threat. The shelter just slows things down because it's a water type and it resists my moves. But then the Sancho and the Eevee are both pretty simple to take out. The Chandler in the tower, this one I call Agatha Jr. She can be an issue for a lot of Pokemon and things do get scary here with Shelter. It's taken down to 10 hit points before I finally win. But with her out of the way, the final two Chandler are generally much easier because they only have one Pokemon on their team. I finish off Jesse and James and then head out onto Cycling Road to do a bunch of additional training. All of this brings Shelter up to level 34, which is not particularly high. I can still run into wild Pokemon in the Safari Zone even when using a Repel. This is another one of the weaknesses of having a slow growth rate Pokemon, and it's the reason that I've chosen not to turn off encounters in a location like this. At the end of the Safari Zone I have a critical choice to make with Shelter. Do I teach it Surf or do I hold off on this HM move? Because in Generation 1 there is no move deleter, so once I teach it I will never be able to get rid of it. Assuming I'm going to need Clamp to trap key foes and withdraw to utilize the badge boost glitch and Ice Beam for coverage against grass types, if I teach Surf I'm basically stuck with my current set for the foreseeable future 
future. Sylph is the next location I go to, and I'm going to do a lot of training here. And finally, I did make the decision to teach Surf in the place of Swift, so that's my set. Let's see how it does throughout the remainder of the mid-game. While training against one of the scientists, I have a uh, unfortunate situation where Shelter does get a reset. Luckily, I don't lose too much time here. I had saved right in front of him anyway. Now, in these videos, it's sometimes hard for me to communicate just how much time I spend training in a location like this, because we're cutting through it quite quickly. I entered Sylph around 53 minutes and 45 seconds, and so by the time I'm completing my training, the clock is over an hour at 1 hour 1 minute and 43 seconds. This is another reason the slow growth rate is terrible. It took me a total of 8 minutes playing on 4 times game speed to just get 6 levels, and I'm only at level 40. That said, this is typically the level I face the rival at, so I'm gonna see how this goes, although I usually fight him at this level when I'm using a fully evolved Pokemon. For first stage Pokemon, I find that somewhere around 48 to 50 tends to be the more optimal range. With that said, I think that I'm gonna lose this fight, but let's see how it goes. Shelter goes for Surf on the Sand Slash and luckily takes it out in one hit, so I'm not going to have to contend with its sand attacks. Next is Cloyster. This Pokemon is why I've kept Clamp around. I can trap it and slowly whittle away. If it eventually does move, it's going to go for Super Sonic against me because of its current move set, and then I can just spam Withdraw, buying time for the confusion to wear off, and minimizing self-inflicted damage. I make it past the Cloyster without getting status, move on to the Magneton. I figured here Clamp was the best choice, but it misses, and then Thundershock deals mass damage. In this case, getting a critical hit, which knocks Shelter out in one turn. Okay, that was a lot worse than I was expecting. That means that Thundershock is dealing more than half when it doesn't get a critical hit, because crits don't do a 2 times multiplier in Generation 1. In the next battle, though, I am able to whittle the Magneton down using Clamp and then finish it off with Surf. Okay, Kadabra's next. It just goes for Disable, then Recover. Confusion follows that, doing about a third. I take it to a sliver of health. It disables Surf, which is really annoying because that's the move I was trying to use. It then uses Confusion again. This inflicts the status condition. Shelter hits itself, and because of that, the Kadabra finishes me off before I make it to his final Pokemon, Flareon. Okay, this fight, as expected, is looking like it's a little bit too difficult, but I don't think that Koga is going to be much easier, because two of his Venonats have Sleep Powder, and they always prioritize it against Water-type Pokemon. To gain a little bit more experience, I'm going to clear out the Fighting Dojo. This brings Shelter up to level 41, and now I have to make a tough choice. Where do I go next? Maybe Erica's gym is actually a good bet because I'm over leveled and Ice Beam is super effective. Plus, there's a lot of trainers in here that I can defeat for experience. Doing this brings Shelter up to level 43, and then I take on the Grass type specialist. Tangela's first, Ice Beam doesn't get the one shot, so Vine Whip does about a quarter. Her lead goes down on the next turn, but this leaves me a little bit concerned about the Weeping Bell and the Gloom. And I was right to be concerned because the Weeping Bell survives, uses Stun Spore, paralyzing me, and then hits with a Razor Leaf, getting a crit, knocking Shelter out. I try the fight again, this time relying on Clamp. This is why I kept the move. I can then chip away at the Tangela, knock it out with Ice Beam, taking no damage in the process, and I repeat this on the Weeping Bell to avoid the status condition. Ice Beam finishes it off, and I move on to her ace, Gloom. I don't want to go for a more offensive strategy here, because the Gloom typically survives things that the Weeping Bell doesn't, so instead I play safe, well, as safe as you can be using Clamp. Luckily it hits, and with that, Erica's defeated, and I've earned myself the Rainbow Badge. With her defeated, I am left with very few choices. I either fight Koga next, or go back and try and fight the rival again. I think right now Koga makes more sense, so I clear out his gym, the two mandatory jugglers, and two tamers, and then I go up against the poison type specialist. Okay, his first Venonat and his third Venonat both know Sleep Powder, and they always prioritize this move against water types like I mentioned before. So I need to play around them using Clamp like I did against Erica. By doing this, I'm able to take out actually all three of his Venonats, sustaining no damage. But Venomoth is faster, and this thing is really scary because of its type advantage over Shelter. I figured Surf made the most sense because it's most consistent and does the most damage, but it does what looks like maybe a fifth, maybe a quarter, to the Venomoth, which is really not encouraging. Luckily, Koga just uses an X attack, then sets up with Toxic, which is not going to have the time it needs to finish Shelter off. I'm able to get in a total of three Surfs as a result, taking his Ace down to red health. And then he kindly gives me another turn by using Double Team, and Shelter wins. I really don't feel like I earned that one. I can see this battle being very difficult in my follow-up playthroughs as well.
But the victory there does give me access to surf outside of battle, so I'm going to take advantage of that and head to Cinnabar Island. This is a location where I can do a lot of good training after I complete the mansion, and this location also brings with it two rare candies. But with a slow growth rate, I'm definitely going to want to save those for later on. And I want as many of them as is humanly possible, so I'm going to fly back to Cerulean City and head over to the power plant where I can collect another one. This is the maximum number of rare candies you can get in a playthrough, which will total 12 by the time I reach the Elite Four. For now, I have access to 11. Returning to Cinnabar Island, I battle all of the trainers in Blaine's gym. Yes, I do need to answer the questions first. I get so many comments about this, people just telling me to talk to the trainers. No, in yellow version, it does not work like that. You have to answer the questions first. I am not playing red and blue. Fighting all of these trainers brings Shelter up to level 47 before I take on Blaine. This battle tends to be quite difficult in yellow version, even when using a water type. I know that sounds like a joke, especially when thinking about games like red and blue, but in yellow version, Blaine is actually really good. Because his fire types have high special stats, I'm not able to do much damage with Surf, so Shelter's going to be two hitting the Ninetales, and likely the remainder of his team. Rapidash is next, it goes for takedown. This does about a third. Surf takes it to orange health, but it gets another attack in. This is Stomp, which causes Shelter to flinch, and as a result, its follow-up takedown knocks me out. As I said, Blaine is challenging in yellow version. That said, because he doesn't have good AI, he has no idea what he should be doing. In some cases, he's just going to waste time, so I figured that eventually Shelter is going to be able to win this battle if I just persist. I make it to the Arcanine, and it just goes for Flamethrower, then sets up Reflect, which is essentially useless. It tries another Reflect, which does nothing, and I finish it off, taking the victory over Blaine. This win gives me the Volcano Badge, and with it comes a 12 12.5% boost to my special stat, and that's very useful because it's going to help out against the rival battle in Sylph, which I need to backtrack to now. As long as Clamp works, I'm able to make it to the Kadabra, and luckily I sustain no damage along the way. Because of the additional levels, Shelter is now faster. I prioritize Ice Beam just in case I get a freeze. It doesn't work out for me, but I'm still able to move on the next turn using Surf, finishing the Psychic type off. Last is Flareon, but of course it's at a type disadvantage, so I'm able to finish the rival off and conclude Sylph. Sabrina is the only gym leader left, but before I fight her, I'm going to grab the TM for Mimic, because I anticipate that this will be useful at some point in the near future. Now, as I head into the Saffron City gym, I do want to mention the fact that I gave up Swift earlier on into the run, which means I can no longer use Withdraw in combination with Flash to badge boost me on Sabrina's Abra. Because of that, I'm going to have to rely on moves like Surf and Ice Beam to defeat her Pokemon. So, let's see how this goes. Shelter is so slow that I can't move first against the Abra. Luckily it just gets a defense boost and then misses a flash and I knock it out for free. Shelter levels up to 50, that would have taken away my badge boost anyway. Next is Kadabra, it chooses Psychic, crits and Shelter faints. The next fight starts off even worse, because Abra gets a flash in, I miss, and as a result, it's able to lower my accuracy for a second time before I move on to the Kadabra. The mid-battle level up takes away the badge boosts, so I don't even get the positive benefit of having my accuracy lowered, and the Kadabra takes so little damage from Surf. Because of that, Recover is able to take it back to full health, so this is not going to work. I probably should do some training, at least enough so that I don't level up mid-battle. I fight one trainer, this guy with a slow bro, he gives me enough experience to level up to 50, and then I make the tough call to use a total of 8 rare candies, boosting Shelter up to level 58. I chose this level because it's over a damage rounding threshold, and it now gives me the outspeed against the Abra. Flash luckily misses on turn 1, so I move on to the Kadabra with my accuracy intact. It just goes for Psy Wave, which is really good, and now Surf is doing about half. Actually, just a little bit more, because when Kadabra uses Recover, it has a sliver of damage. I continue spamming Surf, eventually the Kadabra gets taken down, but not before it uses one Psychic, so I'm left on orange health for the Alakazam. Of course, this Psychic type is faster, it goes for Psychic right away, and Shelter faints. Okay, here's a different approach. I can use Clamp on the Abra to prevent it from attacking, that means my accuracy will never be lowered, and then for the Kadabra, I can use Ice Beam in the hope that I will get a Freeze. If I do, then I'll be able to set up fully with Withdraw, badge boosting both my speed and special. That'll make the Alakazam much easier. Unfortunately, I don't here, but I am able to knock out the Kadabra and move on to the Alakazam. My position is 
is decent. I have minus one accuracy and green health. I go for Ice Beam, once again hoping for the freeze, but instead I get a critical hit, which does more than half. My next Ice Beam takes it down to red health. Still, no freeze, but Alakazam just chooses Psy Wave. Shelder survives, hits with Surf, and Sabrina is defeated. That was definitely a rough battle, and I think I'm going to need to find a way to hold on to Swift for my follow-up playthrough just to add consistency here. Inside the Viridian City Gym, I take advantage of Shelter's typing and do additional training, leveling up to 59 before facing Giovanni. Shelter is slow, as I've mentioned before, and that means that Doug Trio has the ability to just use Fissure on the first turn and one-shot me. It never feels good when that's something Giovanni can do, but there is no play to get around this, so I just have to hope that Doug Trio does nothing. In the next battle, Giovanni has to plug his sponsor, so he uses a guard spec, and I finish off Doug Trio in one hit with Surf. Next is Persian. Now, I decided to badge boost against it with Withdraw so that I can outspeed the remainder of his Pokemon. This ends up working out very well for me because the Persian uses Screech. That double badge boosts me and gives me enough speed right away. Then, I use Surf, knocking it out over two turns, and move on to his ground types. Nidoqueen goes down to a single Surf, meaning the Nidoking is exactly the same, and of course, Rhydon takes takes four times damage, so with that, the gym challenge is complete. This isn't a cause for celebration though, because the hardest part of the game for water types is still remaining. If you didn't know, the reason I typically don't like to teach Surf to my water types is because it's really bad during the Elite Four. Lorelei and Lance both resist it, and the champion has so many options against water types, and his Magneton is typically extremely scary. We're gonna get our first taste for it here in this battle against him on Route 22. But in this case, his Cloister comes before the the Magneton and I leveled up after the Sand Slash, meaning I can spam Withdraw here while it spams Supersonic due to his good AI. This allows me to badge boost, and hopefully it's going to give me enough damage to knock out the Magneton after just one clamp. Instead, I get lucky, my multi-hit move gets a critical hit. In Generation 1, this means all successive hits do the same amount of damage, and I snap out of Confusion, finishing the Magneton out without taking any damage. And more importantly, it was not able to use Thunder Wave. Because of the badge boosts, I'm able to outspeed the Kadabra, finishing it off with two surfs, and of course Flareon is easy to clean up. I don't want to rush into the Elite Four and have a terrible time of it, so I'll invest some time training in Victory Road to level Shelter up to 61. After this, I have a total of four rare candies. Typically, I would use these right before the League, but with Shelter, I don't think that's a good choice. I want to conserve them so that I can use them before key battles if Shelter is leveling up in the middle of the fight, losing its badge boosts. So for now, I'm going into Lorelei at level 61. Hopefully, that is going to be enough. For this battle, I've taught Shelter Mimic in the place of Clamp. I figured that I didn't need that move anymore. First turn, I'm going to use Surf on the Dugong so that it chooses Rest. And on the second turn, I'm going to use Mimic to steal the healing move from Dugong. This way, I'll be able to buy time for myself to use Withdraw a lot and set up my badge boosts all the way to plus six. All I need here is enough damage to three-shot the Dugong so that it's not able to outlast me using Rest constantly. This ends up being the case, and I have around three quarters health remaining when I knock it out. Cloister's next. It gets lucky here with a critical hit from Spike Cannon, and that does a lot of damage, bypassing my setup with defense. I'm left on orange health by the time I knock it out and move on to the Slowbro. Turn 1, it chooses Amnesia, which means turn 2, it is also going to set up. Unfortunately, because of these Amnesias, it's able to survive my Surfs, strike back with its Psychic, and knock Shelter out. I reset before I top Mimic so that I can use Clamp in the next battle. This is much slower, and honestly, it's not very consistent, but I do get back to the Slowbro. Once again, it strikes with Psychic, knocking me out. But using this strategy a second time, I am finally able to knock the Slowbro out and move on to the Jinx. I'm in a good position because I'm using Clamp. I miss on my first turn, but Jinx's double slaps do so little because of my defensive setup. Clamp does massive damage, and I finish the Psychic type off with Surf. All that remains is Lapras. I figured here, Clamp is going to be able to do it. I miss turn one, get hit by Body Slam. That does almost nothing, luckily not paralyzing me. I use Clamp, doing about a third, and then I start to use Surf. 
Sheldr survives a body slam, Lapras doesn't crit, I take it down to a sliver of health, Lorelei uses a super potion, and with that I have won. Cue silly music, because the next trainer is completely trivial. Unlike in Generation 2, where the Hitmons have incredible special defense, in Generation 1 their special stats are complete trash, and Onyx takes 4 times damage from Surf. This is a case where I'm lucky that Sheldr doesn't have the ice typing, because I'm not going to take super effective damage from even the Machamp's submission. But even if I had the ice type it wouldn't matter, because submission is trash and it just misses. Before Agatha, I use one of my stockpiled rare candies to go up to level 63. This is going to prevent a level up, and it's also giving giving me a damage rounding threshold for her because I expect that she might be difficult. Her first Gengar knows Mega Drain, which is a problem when Shelter doesn't have very good special. I'm trying to set up Withdraw, it sets up Substitute, which is frustrating, and I've kept Clamp just so that I can play around some of her more annoying Pokemon like the final Gengar and the Haunter, which both know Hypnosis. Unluckily for me though, Clamp just misses. Gengar goes for Dream Eater though, but then I miss again and it uses Hypnosis, putting Shelter to sleep. As a result, it's able to use Psychic followed by Dream Eater to finish me off. It's always annoying losing to Agatha's final Gengar just because I've spent so long in the fight to get to that point, so these resets really do hurt. In the next battle, things play out a little bit differently. On the Arbok, I get paralyzed, which can be an advantage because then the final Gengar cannot use Hypnosis or Dream Eater. Of course, it is moving first, so Psychic is going to be a problem, and Confuse Ray could mess me up because Parafusion is always awful. In this case, though, the Gengar is the thing that's awful because it just spams Dream Eater and I knock it out with Surf. Before the Dragon Master, I used two of my rare candies, leveling Shelter up to 65 over another damage rounding threshold. Hopefully you can see that because of my slow growth rate and my high level, I'm leaving a lot of experience on the table every time I do this, so Shelter's level at finish is probably going to be one or two levels lower just because I'm playing like this. Okay, let's talk about Lance. I think I am objectively misplaying here, trying to utilize Clamp against the Gyarados. Instead, I should have spammed Ice Beam, hoping for a freeze, or just set up with Withdraw right away. The former of these strategies is a little bit more risky, but maybe has a higher potential to really succeed, because if you do get the freeze, then you essentially just win. But the latter is probably the more consistent play. While I am able to take out his lead, the Dragoner that's next survives Ice Beam, and then he uses a Hyper Potion, it survives my second Ice Beam, then he uses Thunder Wave, and Thunderbolt does enough damage for the knockout. In the next fight, I take Gyarados down to orange health and then choose Ice Beam. Luckily I get the freeze, and because of Lance's healing item, which is a Hyper Potion, he is not able to get rid of the status condition. This means I can set up for free while the Gyarados does nothing, and then two-shot it using Ice Beam. My speed is now 308, and I have super effective damage against all of his remaining Pokemon, meaning Shelter sweeps through the dragons to an easy victory. Okay, once again, I'm gonna leave a lot of experience on the table. I level up to 66 with my final rare candy, and now it is time for the champion. I assume things are going to start off well and then go downhill throughout the Alakazam, Executor, and Magneton. Also, probably the Cloister, that thing has been a menace for water types in the past too. The Sandslash provides me a good opportunity to set up with Withdraw and then knock it out using Surf. I only go to plus 3 in this case, thinking that that would be enough, and then I'm going to rely on Clamp against the Alakazam, but I miss, it goes for Kinesis, not once, not twice, but three times in a row, and I just figured that resetting there was the best choice. I definitely wouldn't have been able to succeed against the rest of his team. One problem with setting up on the Sand Slash is that it's always getting crits when it uses Slash. This bypasses my defense boosts, meaning that I'm not going to have as much time to set up. So once again I only get to plus 3 before I move on to the Alakazam. This time though Clamp hits and I'm able to finish it off. Now I am going to continue relying on Clamp for the Executor to hopefully bypass its Leech Seed. Eventually though I miss, it sets up this annoying status move, and now Clamp is essentially useless because Every time I use it, Leech Seed will drain some of my health. As a result, I'm not going to be able to one-shot the Magneton, and it finishes me with Thunderbolt. Hopefully you're seeing some of the flaws in this strategy. I hadn't seen them yet, and I get even more encouraging results in the next battle because I knock out the Executor without getting hit by Leech Seed. The problem now is that Clamp can still miss on the Magneton, and having to rely on this move so heavily just exposes Shelter to way too much risk. I get hit by Thunder Wave, and then Thunderbolt knocks me out. Instead of Clamp, 
camp, I think I should be using Mimic to steal Earthquake from the Sand Slash. Then I can set up with Withdraw, boosting my attack, which will hopefully give me the damage I need to knock the Magneton out. Also, I now have a physical move that I can use against the Alakazam for a one-shot. Although, I have to use Ice Beam for the Executor, so it is able to set up with the Leech Seed. But Ice Beam is able to two-hit with all my badge boosts, so I'm able to move on to the Magneton, and yes, Shelter is able to one-hit. But that doesn't mean my problems are all gone, because Cloyster is next, and while Spike Cannon doesn't do very much, the fact that it's gaining back health with Leech Seed means I just barely do not two-shot using Surf. And then the saddest thing of all time happens, the champion chooses a full restore, which is a very rare event for him, and as a result, Shelter doesn't have the health it needs to outlast. I was pretty encouraged by that strategy, but I lose a total of three more times using it, and then I had to reconsider my options. The problem is, I just don't have enough health, especially once I get hit by Leech Seed. So I can solve this problem by giving up Ice Beam in favor of having Rest. This allows me to play the fight completely different. Now it doesn't matter how much damage the Sand Slash does, instead I can take my time setting up fully with Withdraw and then mimicking Earthquake. I can do this with safety and then move on to the Alakazam, getting the one shot. Executor is slower and it will get Leech Seed in this case, but that doesn't really matter because I can use Rest to heal back so much of the health. And because the AI doesn't know that I have this volatile status condition, the Executor just keeps spamming it, doing no additional damage. By the time I knock it out, I have green health and I can one shot the Magneton. This puts me in an extremely good position against the Cloister, and even though Surf takes three turns to knock it out, I'm not taking enough damage, well, unless the Cloister gets a critical hit. If that happens, I can still win though, because I have rest, I heal up to full health, tank some spike cannons with my beefy defense stat, and eventually strike back with Surf, knocking the water type out. All that's left is Flareon, and as I've said before, this thing is easy to clean up. So Shelter clocks in with a result of 1 hour 42 minutes and 27 seconds, with 26 resets at level 66, with a game time of 5 hours and 40 minutes. Okay, as expected, with a slow growth rate, Shelter really did not do well. Like with Pidgey, I was left a little bit defeated after this playthrough, and I really did procrastinate on my follow-up. I really didn't want to have to rely on Clamp for a majority of the fights, because that move just feels so awful to use. Anyway, finally I got around to optimizing this thing, so let's see what I was able to pull off, and we're gonna start with Brock. For this fight, I think there are three levels that work for Shelter, but two of them are really not that good, and one of them is just so much more consistent. At level 15, Shelter gets a speed tie with the Onyx, so it can utilize the weird glitch that we found during the Sand Slash run with Bide. If it wins the speed tie on one of the two turns when Bide is first active, then Onyx will pay back no damage to Shelter, this way it can survive longer, and it does need to survive for a long time because it does very little damage to the Onyx on each turn. At level 16, things get a little bit easier because it's always outspeeding the Onyx, so Bide can never do any damage. I beat Brock at this level in my initial playthrough, and I came back and first tried at this level, and uh, I spent an entire day trying to get Shelter by Brock at level 16, and I could not pull it off. So that brings us to level 17, which is by far the most consistent level for Shelter to face Brock at. The reason is that this is the level where Shelter's damage increases against the Onyx. Instead of doing 1 to 2 damage per turn with each tackle, it is doing 2 to 3 damage. That dramatically lowers the number of turns that Shelter needs to be in battle against the Rock Snake, and this is going to be how I get the victory against him in my follow-up playthrough. Now you might be wondering, isn't this going to waste even more time since I'm a slow growth rate, and training one more level in the early game is going to take much longer? Well, yes, this is why I really wanted to defeat him at level 15 or 16, but I figured out some other tricks in the early game to help Shelter go a little bit quicker. First of all, I'm going to battle all wild Pokemon that show up in the early game just for stat experience and regular experience. Then I will target the mandatory bug catcher before all of the other bug catchers. The wild grinding gives me a level where this fight is possible, although I am going to use withdraw to make it just a little bit easier because the Caterpie is level 10 and I'm only level 7. With him defeated, I can then go to Pewter City, heal, and fight the junior trainer in Brock's gym over and over again, blacking out on the Sandshrew. With Shelter, I can do this training 
indefinitely because Withdraw gives me a path to just buy time for the Sand True to knock me out. I found in my playthroughs that by the time Shelter gets to level 12, the training has overall slowed down, so I knock out the Sand True, and then backtrack through Viridian Forest, defeating all the bug catchers that I hadn't fought before. To continue gaining experience, I go all the way back to Route 22, fight the rival here. This battle ends up being very close, even at level 14, but I just barely pull through with one hit point. By the way, if I had lost here, I would have just blacked out to Pewter City, because then I could come back and fight the rival again for more trainer boosted experience. With him defeated, my shelter is level 15, so now I'm going to fight wild Pokemon for two levels, which does take a significant amount of time, but eventually shelter reaches level 17 and then I face Brock. This fight is easier at this level, but I still want everyone to know that there is a big possibility that shelter loses. As you can see here, the Onyx takes me all the way down to one hit point before I knock it out. I was so happy to take the victory here and finally get on my way to completing the game with Shelter a second time. By the way, I am two seconds faster in my Brock split when compared with my level 16 split from the first playthrough, so all this optimization allowed me to complete this split in around the same amount of time. That said, if I was able to do it at level 15 or 16 I would have saved even more time, but it just wasn't working for me. In Mount Moon I do some additional training, but I'm not going to call out all the trainers that I fight because throughout this entire playthrough, Shelter is going to need to fight so many optional trainers just to keep keep leveling up to where it needs for each major threat. By the time I arrive in Cerulean City, I'm around level 21, and then I face Misty first before the rival. This fight is extremely straightforward, I'm not using Bide, instead just spamming Withdraw on the Staryu, setting up my defenses, and then using either Tackle or Water Gun to defeat her Pokemon. This is what I found out during my first playthrough, and it's definitely the best strategy against her. The only flaw with this strategy is that the Starmie has a decent speed stat, so its crit rate is roughly 22%, and when it gets crits with Tackle, it does massive damage. Also, I definitely didn't play fully ideally here. I was hoping to speed the fight up just a little bit by using Supersonic, but I wasted a lot of time trying to use that move, and it just missed so many times. Eventually, I get to chipping away. The Starmie does get a critical hit, bringing Shelter down to 5 hit points. It continues tackling, each one of them doing 2 hit points of damage, and uh, once again, Shelter survives on 1 one hit point. So the first two gym leaders were both extremely close battles. But from here, things get a lot easier now that I have Bubble Beam, I can crush the rivals team, beat all the trainers on Nugget Bridge, head to Vermilion City. On the SSN, I'm still going to pick up Rest, and I am also going to fight Surge right away as well. The only way Shelter loses here is if he uses Thunderbolt. He's not guaranteed to do that. He might just use Mega Punch, Mega Kick, and Growl. I figure that overall I'll save more time here just battling him, because if Bubble Beam gets its 33% chance chance to lower speed, then I can utilize Clamp to trap the Raichu and knock it out without it moving. Unfortunately for me, Surge goes for Thunderbolt once and uh, twice, giving me two resets because these are guaranteed KOs. But in the third battle, Bubble Beam gets the speed drop, I utilize Clamp, and Raichu faints. This is the first time in the run that I am slightly behind my pace from the first playthrough. I am now trailing by 17 seconds, but don't worry, all of the major time saves are going to come throughout the mid game and late game. The wrapping last is next, and she is scary. The strategy here has to be clamp into tackle on each one of her Pokemon. This isn't always the case for water type Pokemon. In some cases with higher special stats, it makes more sense to attack with Bubble Beam. I defeat her on my first attempt, and then before Rock Tunnel, I do take some time to do additional training. I fight this hiker, this youngster, who is like the AJ guy from the anime. His Santru has Fissure. Anyways, he gives me access to this trainer who has two Beedrill, and they give really good experience for this portion of the game. This extra training lets me get a Aurora Beam before I face the extra grass types in Rock Tunnel so that I can just one-shot them instead of having to use Clamp, which is less consistent. It makes me a little bit happy that I was able to find a place for Aurora Beam in this run because I figured it wasn't going to be used at all when I first looked at Shelter's set. Still, its time here is limited because once I reach Celadon City, explore the hideout, and go to the department store, I'm going to grab the TM for Ice Beam and replace Aurora Beam. I also purchased four Carbos to help Shelter out with its speed. The rival in Pokemon Tower is very straightforward, and despite the additional training, the fact that I'm being more consistent has reversed my time deficit, and I now have a 14 second lead. I also fight two optional trainers here, the two channeler who have Haunter. They have decent experience yields, like ordinarily you don't want to fight them, but in this case with Shelter where I need to do a significant amount of training, I think it makes sense to add them in because they're not too far off the beaten path. Okay, this is where things really slow down for Shelter. I'm going to fight almost every trainer on Cycling Road, in Sylph, and in the Fire.
fighting dojo. The reason I'm doing this is because I want consistent damage ranges against the next major battle that I decide to do. There are three options for this, either Erika, Koga, or the rival in Sylph. To make my Brock split slightly faster, I face the rival on Route 22, so he's now going to have Jolteon on his team in the Sylph battle, and I really can't fight it at this level. So that eliminates him from the pool, and I have to choose between Erika or Koga. I decided on facing the grass types first because I can get so much experience from the gym trainers, as well as then having access to strength once I beat Koga, requiring slightly less backtracking for the rare candy in the warden's house. In order to make Erika more consistent, I need to level my shelter all the way until it hits it's level 48. I run out of experience in Sylph and I have to go to Route 15 to continue my training. This is generally a place you don't want to train because it takes a very long time, but with a lot of bad first stage Pokemon, I end up fighting trainers here. I just barely don't have enough experience after beating all the trainers in Erika's gym to get to 48, but I am close enough that once I knock out the Tangela and probably the Weaving Bell, I'll level up. So let's see if this is enough. I use Ice Beam on the Tangela, get the lucky range and knock it out. Then against the Weaving Bell, it survives. Luckily, I'm doing enough damage for her to use a super potion, so I take it out for free and then level up, knocking the gloom out in a single hit. Interestingly enough, I did Erica in the same order last time, and I am now a minute and five seconds ahead of my previous pace, despite all of this training that I've done. With Erica defeated, I'm now going to go and face Koga. In his gym, I fight the two tamers for additional experience, and then I go up against the poison type specialist. This battle's a little bit inconsistent because once again I have to rely on Clamp. Yes, this is just the best way for Shelter to play this portion of the game, there really aren't any other options. Due to an annoying miss and some status conditions, Shelter does have one reset here before it comes back in and defeats Koga on its second attempt. With Surf outside of battle, I'm going to head south to Cinnabar Island next, fighting Psyche along the way. And uh, unfortunately for me, this fight does end up in a loss, which I can't believe. These Seeking are just really not very good. But uh, yeah, Super Sonic is my undoing. Obviously resetting here is the wrong choice because they then I would have to face Koga again, so I'll just take the blackout. I have to wait until my HM users faint, which is a little bit annoying. It takes some time, but I also get a little bit more experience because it can battle Psyche again, defeating two of his Pokemon for a second time. In Blaine's gym, I fight all of the trainers for additional experience, and then I go up against the fire type specialist. I'm four levels higher than I was last time, but this fight is still difficult. Notably, I don't have an outspeed on any of his Pokemon, and even if I get badge boosted, I'm about to level up, so there is the potential potential for me to lose my speed stat, and I do after the Rapidash. Luckily I still have green health for the Arcanine, and both Flamethrower and Fire Blast aren't going to do very much damage. But Takedown is. Still, Shelter gets two hits in because it has a high defense stat, and I defeat Blaine. Things were a little bit bumpy in this section of the game, so I lost some of my lead. I am now only 12 seconds ahead of my first playthrough. It does look like this playthrough is going to clock in with a similar time to the first one right now, but please don't worry, I am still going to save a lot of time in the late game. I swear. Okay, so let's take on the rival in Sylph. Both Sandslash and Ninetales are weak to Surf, and then the Cloister gives me an opportunity to set up with Withdraw. Because I fought Blaine, I'm getting badge boosts in both my speed and special stats, so then I can use Surf to knock out the Cloister as well as the Kadabra. After that, I have Jolteon to deal with, and I decided to go for Clamp here. It misses, and Jolteon hits a Thundershock, but due to my badge boost, it does almost nothing. I hit with Clamp on the next turn, and after three consecutive hits, his Ace faints. I've carefully planned my experience, so the Jolteon shouldn't be a problem in the future just because I have Withdraw. In Sabrina's gym, I face two optional trainers. This is so that I level up to 54 so that I won't lose my badge boosts in the battle against her. I teach Swift in the place of Clamp. It is finally time to get rid of that annoying, inconsistent move. And then I can stack up Withdraw and Flash, badge boosting my attack stat to extreme levels so that Swift one-shots all of Sabrina's Pokemon. And yes, it even does one-shot the Alakazam. This is where I'm starting to gain a lead, I'm now one minute ahead of my former pace. Giovanni is an interesting case, because you'd think that Shelter has an advantage against him due to its typing, and yes, technically I do, but in yellow version, his two Nidos both know Thunder, and because of Shelter's low special stat, it takes a lot of damage from these moves. At level 54, Nido Queen's Thunder deals between 59 and 70% damage, and Nido King's Thunder deals 62 to 73% damage. Also, Shelter is not able to one-hit them, so I would have to rely on something like a critical hit or clamp, but I've already deleted that, so that's not going to work out. Instead, what I found worked best here is using 8 rare candies to level up from 55 to 63. 
This gives me guaranteed one hits on all of his Pokemon except the Persian. I did spend two turns here setting up with Withdrawal and the Doug Trio. This is an older strategy that I was playing around with on Giovanni. It's just not as good. I should have attacked right away and knocked the Doug Trio out with Surf, preventing it from using moves like Fissure or Sand Attack. That said, Shelter pulls off a Miracle, and while it does miss once against the Nidoqueen and tank a Thunder, it still manages to sweep through Giovanni's team and win on its first attempt. I grab the Power Plant candy, and then I go up against the rival. I forgot one small thing when playing this fight. I needed to level up just to 64 for the Cloister, but I don't have enough experience. I was going to fight one trainer before the Power Plant to ensure that this would happen, but without that experience, I get paralyzed on the Jolteon and lose. I fill in the training now, come back at level 64, and then I can use Withdraw on the Cloister to badge boost and once again defeat the Jolteon. Still though, uh, things are not looking good. Maybe I am going to get a worse time in this playthrough. I have now two minutes in three seconds behind my former pace. And things are going to slow down a little bit in Victory Road because I do fight one trainer as well as two wild Pokemon to level Shelter up to 65 before starting the league. Okay, here's where all the optimizations come into play. On Lorelei, I'm going to use Withdraw and Mimic to take Rest so that I can buy my time here, setting up with badge boosts. That said, I don't want to use Rest if I don't absolutely have to. In the end, I decided it was the best choice against the Lapras, but it doesn't really matter. I still managed to knock out her ace and move on to the next trainer, who of course is Agatha. Before her, I used two rare candies going up over a damage rounding threshold to level 68. To ensure this fight is as consistent as possible, I mimic substitutes, setting up my defenses, and then I can badge boost, improving my special stat, and knock out her Pokemon quickly, hopefully avoiding hypnosis, which I luckily do, and I gain back my time lead, so I'm now 30 seconds ahead of my former pace. One rare candy before Lance, so I don't have a mid-battle level up, and then I take my time setting up on the Gyarados for as long as I can, just to improve improve my stats. I really want to get more than 170 speed if possible so that they move first against the Aerodactyl. After that with Ice Beam and Surf I sweep his team and take an easy victory. I'm now 1 minute and 13 seconds ahead of my former pace. But remember, the champions slowed me down significantly. So here is where I'm going to gain back all the time. I use one rare candy going up to level 70 and now let's face the final trainer of the run. For this battle, the moveset that made the most sense to me is Surf, Withdraw, Mimic, and Rest. Withdraw in combination with Rest allow me to set up against the Sand Slash, and Mimic allows me to steal Earthquake for physical damage. Surf one-shots the Sand Slash, with Badge Boost maxed, I can one-shot the Psychic type, and then the Executor is just stuck using Leech Seed, and while this is annoying, I'm just going to be able to use Rest, heal my health, and then strike back with Resisted Earthquakes and eventually knock it out. And yes, the Ground type move does do more damage, even though Surf has a higher effective power. With Executor finished off, I face the Cloister. There is a danger here here that it crits with Spike Cannon, but if it doesn't, this move is going to deal so little damage and it's its only choice. So Surf two shots, I one hit the Nine Tails with Surf, move on to the Jolteon, I have super effective damage and I still have my speed boost because I'm a slow growth rate Pokemon, so that's one case where it's useful. Earthquake hits, his ace faints, and Shelter clocks in with a time 7 minutes and 50 seconds ahead of its former result. It gets a real time of 1 hour 34 minutes and 37 seconds. 4 resets, 12 blackouts, at level level 70 with a game time of 6 hours and 7 minutes. Before we rank Shelter, I just want to say thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. It really means the world to me. Additionally, thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Also, I want to take a little bit of time just to reflect on what I think could make Shelter go faster. I never suggest that my times are the best possible times. I still think as a player I have a lot to learn and improve. That said, some of the stuff that you need to do with Shelter is luck oriented, like winning Barak at level 15 or 16. That would definitely improve its overall results and time. Of course, if we removed the annoying blackout against Psyche, then I would have had a faster time, and I could have had less resets overall, just getting luckier in some small fights, like Surge for example. Still, I'm satisfied with these results at least for now. I think this is a good case study of why the slow growth rate is a major obstacle for a Pokemon to overcome in a solo challenge. Over two years ago, I played runs with Snake Pokemon, Onyx, and Ekans, and with two years of additional experience, Shelter is still only 
only able to rank alongside these Pokémon. It is slightly slower than Onix's time and slightly faster when compared with Ekans. So today it earns itself a placement in the Surge tier near the end, and I guess that makes sense because he was able to defeat it twice. With this run, my tier list now has 99 Pokémon ranked in it. I am so close to three digits. While it seems like we're still about a third away from finishing all the Pokémon in the decks, that's not entirely true because there are Pokémon that aren't included in this tier list that I have done solo runs with. To name some of those Pokémon, there are actually quite a few. Slowpoke, Jigglypuff, Clefairy, Psyduck, Machamp, Tauros, Snorlax, Seam. I'm gonna have to re-rank most of those Pokémon, and I will be making videos to do that, but just know that in 2025, the Yellow series will come to its conclusion. I've had so much fun doing this, and I can't wait to finally complete this tier list. Up next in Yellow, I'm gonna be using more water types of first stage Pokémon, as well as some final evolution in a Versus video. Before we move on to that though, there's one last thing to do with Shelter. I'm gonna face the Hidden Oak battle. If you're unaware, I haven't described it in a while, but this is actually coded onto every yellow ROM. It's just an unused battle in the code, so you never get to fight him during regular gameplay. Shelter is kind of broken against his team, so all of his Pokemon only have the moves that they would know by level up at the levels that they currently are. This is likely an artifact coming from Red and Blue, when that's how all Pokemon were assigned their movesets. In in yellow version, the developers took a lot of time and care to assign the Pokémon custom sets to make the game a little bit more difficult and interesting. But of course, since the Oak battle was unused, they didn't do this for his team. Because of that, Tauros has both Tail Whip and Leer, meaning it can lower my defense in two different ways. I could technically exploit this with the Badge Boost glitch with Withdraw, raising my defense over and over as it gets lowered by the Tauros, but that's not going to work because of where I'm going to level up. After I defeat the Tauros, as well as the Executive, Tour, then I am going to level up. But this isn't the worst case scenario either because now I'm fighting the Arcanine and it can also lower my defense with Leer. It has the completely useless move Roar, I resist Ember, and Takedown isn't that scary when I'm setting up my defense stat. This allows me to badge boost to a ridiculous level. Eventually, I decide to one-shot the Arcanine, move on to the Venusaur. I thought that Stomp, which I mimicked from Executor, would do enough damage, but it doesn't. However, the Grass type just sets up with Solar Beam and I knock it out on the next turn. All that's left is Gyarados. I'm pretty sure I've got this. I go for Stomp. It doesn't get the knockout. Oak's Ace, which is level 70, strikes back with Hyper Beam. It gets a critical hit, dealing massive damage, and fittingly, Shelder survives on one hit point and defeats Oak in the same way that it defeated both Barak and Misty. Okay, if you made it this far, you're incredible. Thank you so much. I will see you in my next video.